take your seats down the back there. Welcome. What a beautiful day. Welcome to the National Monument to Migration event. I am pleased to introduce Wiradjuri Gadigal Elder, Auntie Joan Bell. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and I'm not taking my coat off for anybody. <laughs> I'm a cold frog. <laughs> and I'm here to do a welcome, a welcome to country for you guys. And I'd like to let you know that I sit on the board of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, and that Metro Lauk is the body for the protection and preservation of all Aboriginal culture and heritage within its boundaries. That includes Sydney CBD and surrounding local 24 government areas, from Canterbury Bankstown to Cessnock. And we are proud to acknowledge all respective traditional owners and custodians for this place now called Sydney. My name is Joan Bell. My family and friends know me simply as Auntie Ding. It's easier, Ding Bell. <laughs> I am a proud Wiradjuri Gadiga woman. Wiradjuri, my mother's ancestry, and Gadiga is my dad's ancestry. I am a mother of 10, a grandmother, a great-grandmother and a great-great-grandmother of 81 grandchildren. I'm stamping my foot in Australia. <laughs> my Gadigal ancestor was a local custodian who was taken to Parramatta's Natives Institute and in 1845 was taken by Reverend John Cartwright to Pajong, Gundingara country near Gunning, New South Wales, to work. I was born at a little central west New South Wales Wiradjuri town called Peak Hill. However, I spent my younger years learning how to go walk about with my family. Wiradjuri, Gadigal, Gadigal, Wiradjuri. It was great. And I lived on the block. You may have heard of the block in Redfern. Yeah, I lived on the block for 15 years. It was great. I now live on the new block in Waterloo. We honour our Gadigal, Eora elders and leaders, including Barangaroo, Hemaway, and many others who fought the first boat people who landed in Sydney Cove in 1770 and 1778. My respects to Gadigal elders, past and present. We honour our matriarchs and patriarchs. Because of them, we can. We can. My respects to all elders and peoples from other First Nations here today. We listen to the old people, ancestors, and they show us the right path. They protect us, they help us. They take care of us. We believe in the spirit of our ancestors. If we're doing wrong, they come back and they let us know we don't sleep so good at night. This welcome to country is made in the spirit of peace and harmony with all peoples of modern Sydney. Our aim as local custodians is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our right to declare our special place in the pre and post history of the Sydney region. Respect is taking responsibility for the past, the present and the future. 
evidence of our occupation, ownership and nationhood can be seen everywhere throughout our country. Our signature is in the land, not just in our DNA. Respect is everything. Respect is in how a woman digs in the earth for yams. Very careful. We are taught how to dig for yams. Respect is in the rivers, the sea, and the breeze quietly moving through country. The law of this land says that you must respect and honour all the people and all parts of the country. With this welcome, we ask that you all will respect the law of the country. Give honour, be respectful, be polite, be gentle and patient with all. Respect is everything living and growing. Please look after the land, sea and rivers. Then the land, sea and rivers will look after you. In conclusion, I say to you, respect shapes us and lifts up the people. This is my welcome to you. From the heart, I say, welcome to the land of my ancestors. Welcome to my country. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie Joan Bell from the Metropolitan Land Council for that warm welcome to country and 81 little ones, that's phenomenal. <laughs> Um, I too acknowledge that we are standing today on country that is traditionally owned by the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and that our ceremony takes place on their lands and waters. I pay my respects to traditional owners and elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present here today. Hello, my name is Virginia Langerberg. I'm a senior reporter and presenter for SBS World News. I was born in Sweden and I also have a proud Tanzanian heritage. My, man, my family migrated to South Australia when I was a young child. It is my pleasure to be your host for today's ceremony. This is the third year I have the honour of doing this and my family's name is also on the wall so I, can, I know how special it is to be part of all of this. It was such a wonderful ceremony every time I've taken part in this. I'd like to welcome every one of you as donors and supporters of Australia's National Maritime Museum on this very special day to unveil panels on Australia's National Monument to Migration. There are several distinguished guests present who I wish to acknowledge, representatives from the following embassies and consulates, Ireland, Lebanon, Malaysia, Poland, representatives from our media supporter SBS, Representatives from UNHCR, donors and sponsors and supporters of the museum, and other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today, here at the museum, we celebrate the contribution migrants have made to this country. We hope that today can remind us all of the great fortune we share here today, um, as collective cultures and communities united in celebration both of journeying and of coming home. Today we are adding 879 names to the National Monument to Migration of people who represent 52 different countries. The top 10 communities in order of representation in today's ceremony are the United Kingdom, Greece, Germany, Poland, Ireland, Malta, Lebanon, China, India and the Netherlands. That is really wonderful. Do we have, can we get a round of applause for all of those countries? And it really does show the changing diversity here in Australia. Now, please raise your hand for me if you are a migrant or the child of a migrant. I should put my hand up too. <laughs> and keep your hand in the air if your name is being added to the monument today. Congratulations, today is all about you.
Today your names will join more than 32,000 inscriptions on this national monument. You're all an esteemed company and your contribution is helping to recognise our proud, diverse national story. Now, before we go on, just some housekeeping. Because not everyone could make it today, the event is being recorded and it will be posted to the museum's website. We'll also send you a link to the recording for you to share with your family and friends. We'd also love you to share your experience of the day if you are posting videos or photos. Please use the hashtag, hashtag CMuseum and tag us at, at CMuseum. You might also notice another camera in the corner here. This is my colleague from SBS. We will be featuring this in tonight's uh, bulletin at 6.30, but if anyone doesn't want their face shown, just um, go over, give them a tap on the shoulder and, and we'll make sure you're not in it. But um, otherwise, look out for your faces at 6.30 tonight on SBS World News. Now for the bathroom, please note that there are toilets uh, behind us here on the first floor, Wharf 7. There's just doors um, to the right if you're looking at it here from the tent. Um, and more around the harbour side of the museum next to Ripple's Cafe. We do have photographers with us filming the event. If you prefer not to be photographed, please just let them know. And in a moment, we'll hear from some of the families whose names are being added to the monument. But first, I'd like to introduce the museum's Acting Deputy Director, Michael Baldwin. Thank you, Virginia. Distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Adi Joan, for your welcome. And I too acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the Bamal and Badu, the lands and the waters on which the museum is located, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also to warmly acknowledge all First Nations people who are here with us today. It is such an honour for me to be here to acknowledge the families whose names appear on the monument. This is my first um, unveiling ceremony. I feel incredibly privileged to be a part of today's uh, ceremony and it's an honour for me to welcome all of you to this wonderful organisation, the Australian National Maritime Museum and the National Monument to Migration, the Welcome Wall. We are, of course, the Museum of the Sea, and it is fitting that we are here, near to where so many migrants first disembarked after a long journey to their new home. The wharves just over to my left have witnessed many, many thousands of arrivals over many decades. The migration story tells a story of modern Australia. We say that we are a nation shaped by sea, but we're also a nation proudly shaped by migration. The stories of migrants speak to universal themes such as belonging and love and adventure, family and safety. Some stories are marked by adversity and loss and sadness. Some are less dramatic, but everyone, every story is a story of hope. hope for a better life, for themselves, for their children, hope for a safer life, hope for a fresh start, second beginnings in some instances, hope for a better education, a better career, hope for a better future. The process of migration in every instance involves leaving your existing home and starting again. For many, it means leaving the lands of forebears, leaving behind deep cultural and family connections to lands, to make new connections in new lands, to meet new people, create new communities, new languages, traditions, homes and possessions. The decision to leave all that you have known, to leave behind all that is familiar, to embark on a journey to a new place is never easy, regardless of the circumstances, and it requires great bravery, as many of you know and have experienced firsthand. My family's migration story is no doubt similar to many early Anglo-Australian immigrants. My great-great-grandfather travelled to Australia from the north of England in the 1860s. He was accompanied by his wife and four of their children. The journey was hard, 
conditions were cramped. They buried their baby at sea on the journey here. After months of travel, my ancestors arrived in Moreton Bay and made a new home in the ancestral lands of the Turtle people in Mianjin, or the town that they knew as Brisbane. They could bring with them very, very little of what they had left behind. But what they did bring, I have it at home, was a vast family Bible with big brass clips. And in that book, I recorded the names and the dates of generations of people who lived in one little village, who were baptised, married and died and were, were buried from that same little village church. They uprooted their lives, left all that they knew. That must have required great bravery and great hope. Hope for a better future, a better home, a better place for themselves and the people that they loved most of all. The Australian migration story is one of the pillars of our work here at the museum. We are the only national cultural institution with a focus on migration. The museum's migration-related activities include developing collections and exhibitions, programs and events, and our very popular education resources, as well, of course, as research. In December last year, the museum launched Migration Stories, a new digital experience dedicated to sharing complex, challenging and emotional stories about how people are shaped by migration. This expands on the work of the National Monument to Migration and the Welcome Wall. Faces of Migration is the first stage of our digital platform, which will be continually updated with new stories to create a centre for migration storytelling. Faces of Migration currently features more than 25 stories of how people have been shaped by migration. You can visit this new experience by visiting the museum website, and I encourage you to do that this afternoon or this evening when you get back home. By placing your family on the National Monument, you have made a donation to the Migration Heritage Fund. The monument is an important way for the museum to honour, collect and hold your stories, which collectively are an important element of our national story. Thank you for your donation. Every person named on the Welcome Wall is an important part of our museum family. We consider you to be our champions, our ambassadors, and I hope that you will think of the museum as your second home as well. There are many, many organisations that help us to do what we do, and I would like to acknowledge all of them, the embassies, the consulates, the community and media organisations that all assist us in spreading the important word of the National Monument and the story of migration in Australia. I would particularly like to thank SBS for your leadership and your passion uh, for multicultural and multiculturalism in Australia. SBS is a founding partner of the museum's Welcome Wall, and we thank you for your continued support of the museum's migration campaigns. I feel very, very proud to be part of an organisation that champions the importance of migration to our national story. I'm very privileged to work here with some outstanding professionals who have worked particularly very hard to make today's event a success. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Tina Kutsianis, Pamela Proestos and Lucy Munivar, who are part of our partnerships team here at the museum. And thank you all for coming to share this morning's ceremony with us. But this is just the beginning. I really hope you will stay and enjoy the museum and our amazing vessels on the water. As something of an incentive, I'm very happy to extend to you a 50% discount today on our See It All ticket. Please stay and enjoy the wonderful experience, the exhibitions and the ships that are part of the Australian National Maritime Collection. Please mention to my colleagues at the front desk that you are here as part of today's ceremony and they will discount your ticket to, uh, to see it all here at the museum today. On behalf of our director, Daryl Karp, it's my huge privilege to say welcome and thank you for being with us.
Thank you, Michael, and for sharing your family's story of sacrifice to be here. Um, now, everyone, if you please like to join me in standing and welcoming Olivia Fox, a Wiradjuri woman, who will sing the national anthem in both English and the language of the Eora Nation. to Australia and is now the Chief Operating Officer at a leading tuition college. Please make Christina feel welcome. Thank you, Virginia. A very good morning, distinguished guests and friends. Walls I call Australia home for over 30 years in my Malaysian heritage, we like to begin by saying Salam Sajatra, which means peace and prosperity to you. And so today, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the land of the Gadigal people. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It is my joy and thank you to the Australian Maritime Museum for this honor to share my migration story. Migration is not just crossing a border. It is the courage to embrace new opportunities and contribute to a brighter future. Australia truly welcomes those who dare to dream. The impact on migration of, on Australia is a true testament to the power of unity. People from different corners of the world come together to create a mosaic of opportunity, harmony and shared prosperity. My first memory of Australia was when I was an international student in 1991. It was a hot summer's day in February and my marketing lecturer came into class in an unwrinkled, in a wrinkled, unironed shirt. I was speechless. 
After the initial culture shock of my lecturer presenting in the wrinkled, unironed shirt, he casually said, Hello, my name is Michael. Shock number two. You see, in my country of origin, Malaysia, this type of behavior, casual behavior, is contrary to what I was used to. In Malaysia, culturally, lecturers are presented in ties and crisply ironed shirts. We are expected to formally address them by Mr. or Mrs. And it was years later that I found out a linen shirt worn by my marketing lecturer, Michael, are worn during summer and good quality linen is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I completed my undergraduate degree at RMIT University in 1995. I got married and worked for the University of Melbourne. I gave birth to my two beautiful daughters, Zoe and Ashley. After some years, I've moved to Malaysia for family reasons. This sounds like a fairy tale. Educated, married, and a young family. However, this was not the case. I migrated back to Melbourne in 2005. I was a single mother with two daughters in tow, two suitcases, little finances, and limited network. It was one of the toughest times of my life. As a determined single young mother and sort of new migrant again, what I brought with me to Australia was loads of courage and hope to grow and succeed. I saw this as a period of opportunity for all of us. I saw a promising future in the land of abundance, Australia. I was not one of the very early migrants of Australia. In the early 90s, there were already Malaysians in Melbourne. My parents, like many at that time, worked hard sacrificed and sent their children overseas for tertiary education for a better future. I recall that I saw Australia as a land of opportunity if I persevered and worked hard. Being an Asian, and as most Asians are known, for our strong work ethic, I worked hard and was given the opportunity to progress and have a good rewarding career whilst raising young children. So let's fast forward to the next 18 years. My career grew and I gained numerous management and executive positions. Currently, I am the Chief Operating Officer of a national education business called North Shore Coaching College. I even found love and I'm married to my second husband, Roger, who's here with me today. And yes, one of the most beautiful parts of living in Australia is multiculturalism. Melbourne, like most cities in Australia, is now a culturally diverse melting pot of many races. Diversity and inclusivity is normal. There's fairness and opportunity to contribute for a better living. You see, when I first arrived in 2005 as a single mother with two young daughters, we decided to go on a picnic. I used all I had to buy roast chicken and coleslaw for Woolworths and headed to the park. We did not own a luxurious picnic mat as I used one of our blankets as a mat and my daughter's tea party set as cutlery. The families there invited my daughters to play. My daughters even got lollies from the other families. I was very happy. That summer's day in the park with my children laughing and with the generosity of families around us remains one of my most cherished memories in my life. We were treated by those families as equals and with care and kindness. This experience and many other examples of the generosity shown by those around me inspired me to give back to my community. I truly believe in the circle of abundance. When you do good for others, those around will feel good. They will then continue to give the goodness and soon the entire community is being lifted by this joy. This ripple effect is continuous because I believe there is an innate intention in all of us to wish joy and abundance for each other. I'm very proud to continue the circle of abundance, serving and leading in my various community portfolios.
Some of the examples of involuntary contributions I serve are Mental Health Foundation Australia. I've been a multicultural attaché now for close to nine years, and one of my fondest memories was cooking and serving for the thousands of meals for disadvantaged Victorians in 2020 and 2021 lockdowns, or promoting the Chinese culture and language in my role as the Vice President of the Chinese Association of Victoria and the President for the Australian Asian Family Association, or contributing to RMIT University mentoring program or reaching out to multicultural communities locally and globally via my podcast, MYC Heart Connectors. So, for me to be standing here today and with the opportunity to be a community advocate and a career where I'm blessed to be involved in educating our youth and a migrant of over 30 years is a defining milestone in a long and important journey. Over the years, I'm very honoured and humbled to be recognized for my community service by various organizations. In 2022, I was inducted to the inaugural honor roll by the Victorian Multicultural Commission for my community service. Distinguished guests and friends, my story was not predestined, but grew out of courage, chance, and hope. In recent years, I have made more conscious effort to give back, serve, and lead for a better Australia. I followed my passion and my intuition, and I will continue to do so. I have assimilated, collaborated, and immersed myself with other community groups, and I will continue to work hard to bring communities together in this land we call home. As I close, I believe the migrant mentality should be one that celebrates the uniqueness of the land we call home whilst honouring the uniqueness of our heritage and where we have come from. We must embrace our diverse humanity as we help to create a fair, inclusive and harmonious country. This is our home. So to live our very best life, we must continue to work hard, not take things for granted, and be the change we want to see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for sharing your story. And I'm trying to think back to all the people I've shopped over the years with my unironed t-shirts as well. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Grace Tuma, whose grandparents migrated from Lebanon. Please make her welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As the granddaughter of Lebanese migrants, it is an immense privilege to stand before you today as we come together to celebrate the unveiling of the new names added to the National Monument to Migration. Each of the monuments over 32,000 names is a powerful reminder of the journeys, sacrifices, and courage of all migrants who have come to Australia in search of a better life for themselves and for their families. All four of my grandparents migrated from Lebanon to Australia. Like the resilient cedar tree that adorns their homeland's flag, the Lebanese migrants who arrived in Australia stood tall and strong, deeply rooted in their faith and culture. We honour their legacy today and every day by recognising the value in their journeys and the enormity of their sacrifice. On behalf of my family, I would like to share with you all the migration journeys of my grandparents, whose names appear on the monument before you today. My father's late parents, Michael and Suo Tuma, travelled from their village of Wedi Ganyubin in Lebanon to Sydney, Australia. <coughs> Having borrowed money to afford a ticket to Sydney, Michael arrived by boat on the 21st of July, 1967. Despite not knowing any English and having very little support, his drive and his unbreakable work ethic enabled him to save up enough money to eventually send for his wife, Seward, and their two young children by plane in 1968. 
my grandparents embraced the chance to raise a family in a country filled with endless opportunities, and my late grandfather Michael was known by many to have considered Australia his true home. Starting off working in sandstone masonry and labouring, Michael later became a factory worker and would eventually enter the building business. My grandmother, Suhod, worked in a Lebanese bakery and then as a school cleaner. Both of my grandparents invested heavily in the futures of their five children. For them, family always came first. Our family owes so much to their sacrifice, to their gift of love, that has made so much of our lives possible. My mother's parents, Dumit and Nadia Bunasif, are here with us today. Dumit and his twin brother left their village of Hasrun and sailed to Sydney, arriving on the 16th of July, 1964. They were motivated by the desire for a better future and were supported by their older siblings and uncle who were already settled in Australia. Nadia travelled from Wedi Kanyubin to Sydney, arriving in June 1966 with her mother and seven of her siblings. The journey was one filled with excitement and anticipation as she prepared to reunite with her father and her other three siblings who had arrived in Australia earlier. Both started off as factory workers. Dumit would later go into labouring and plumbing and Nadia would take on cleaning and catering. Both were keen to make a life for themselves in this new land. Their paths would collide when one of Nadia's bud brothers befriended a young Dumit, introducing him to his family and to Nadia. They married on the 24th of May, 1969, and later welcomed four children, working selflessly to provide each of them with the opportunities they themselves had not had. Becoming Australian citizens was a profound milestone for each of my grandparents. My late grandparents, Michael and Suhod, gained citizenship in 1976. My other grandparents, Nadia and Dumit, gained citizenship in 1972. For Nadia, it was a truly proud moment. It meant finally belonging to this country that had given her and her family so much. Dumit saw it as an additional layer of identity, an acknowledgement of the journey he had undertaken while still cherishing his Lebanese heritage. Being here today at this ceremony is another pivotal moment in their journeys. My grandfather Dumit feels immense pride and happiness in having his name memorialized. For my grandmother Nadia, who worked previously in catering at the Maritime Museum for eight years, this is truly a heartfelt honor. The inscription bearing their names represents not just their individual progress, but the progress of their entire family a testament to the sacrifices and triumphs of the migrant experience. The migrant stories of each of my grandparents reflect courage, resilience, and above all, unwavering hope. They left behind their homeland, their familiar surroundings, and embraced the unknown, bringing only the essentials of few belongings, clothes, and cherished family photos. They had few mementos of their homeland and life before but they had something even more significant, the power of memory. Their stories shared with their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren serve as a reminder of their roots. Their love of God, love of the land and love of family have formed the solid trunk of our family tree, holding us steady through the seasons of life. As the late Lebanese American poet Edel Adnan once wrote, Migration is the bridge that connects our past to our future, carrying our heritage forward. Let the names on the migration wall stand as a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who have journeyed to this great land. Let us honour their legacy by fostering a society that values inclusivity, compassion and unity. And may the cedar tree continue to inspire us reminding us of the enduring spirit of the Lebanese people and the remarkable contributions they have made to our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. What a beautiful story and welcome to her grandparents as well. I'd now like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, an Australian of Polish heritage who will share his grandparents' migration story. Please make welcome Daniel Pons.
Thank you for your wonderful introduction, and thank you to Pamela Prostos for the opportunity to speak about my grandparents today, Antony and Pelagia Zhuschuk, who are among the 27 other Polish immigrants whose names have officially been added to the National Monument of Migration today. My name is Daniel Pomes, and I represent the third generation of Polish immigrants and the physical manifestation of my grandmother Pelagia's own dreams from the day she arrived in Australia when she wrote in her diary that she hopes and dreams of beginning a new life in Australia with new friends. Although I never had the chance to meet my grandfather, who sadly died long before I was born, his love for all things Polish, especially Polish cuisine, has been passed down to myself and my brother Anthony, who also have a love for pierogi, which are Polish meat dumplings, barszcz, which, are, which is beetroot soup, uh, and golomki, which is Polish cabbage rolls with rice and minced meat. And of course, Polish desserts, especially ponczki, which are Polish jam donuts, and krusty, which are traditional fried and sugar-coasted twisty pastries. My brother and I have continued to embrace our Polish heritage by being part of the Polish folkloric dance group, Serenko, participating in various Polish cultural festivals and events. Anthony and I grew up on stories about our grandparents, and I would like to pay tribute to my grandparents by telling you their immigration stories today. Anthony Brzuszczak was born in Kabat, Poland on the 21st of August, 1923. He was the eldest son of six children with two sisters and three brothers. At the age of 16, whilst hiding under a bridge, German forces invaded Poland and captured Antony, and, was, and he was forced to work in a German work camp uh, and a German driver. Antony remained at the work camp until 1948, later becoming a transport driver in British-occupied Germany until 1950. It was then that Antony took the chance to emigrate to Australia on the 17th of April, 1950, arriving in Sydney on the vessel the General Stewart. Antony was employed by Sir Anthony Horton, a successful grazier and stock breeder, as a caretaker and driver. And whilst living in Sydney, Antony commenced a pen pal relationship with a Polish lady named Pelagia Lewak back in Poland, who would later become my grandmother. Pelagia Lewak was born on the 2nd of January, 1933, in Wiedertze Male, Lublin, Poland the youngest of two daughters. Pelagia was torn apart from her family during the Second World War when she and her sister were separated from and forced to live with different family members after their mother was shot and their father abandoned them. Okay. Fleeing with Polish resistance after the invasion of Polish, uh, Poland by German troops, Pelagia remembers having to hide in fields of cabbages during one air raid Although Pelagia survived the bombing, many villagers were killed during the air raid. Pelagia came, became a nanny and a babysitter to her relatives' children and produced beautifully hand-decorated Christmas bubbles. Pelagia later worked in a literary house as a librarian and literary assistant, publishing and editing books. During this time, Pelagia answered an advertisement in a Polish newspaper seeking a pen pal relationship uh, to write to a young man of Polish ancestry living in Sydney, Australia. Pelagia and the young man, who was Antony Przyszczak, commenced a six-year pen pal relationship that soon turned to writing love letters to each other and sending photos and exchanging cards on birthdays and other special occasions. Pelagia decided to leave Poland and emigrate to Australia and her new life on the 7th of March, 1961. Pelagia arrived in Sydney on the vessel Sydney and Pelagia and Antony Przyszczak started their new lives in Australia as Australian citizens and married on the 6th of January 1962. Pelagia would then give birth to a baby girl named Isabella, who would become my mother. Antony and Pelagia remained closely tied to the Polish community in Sydney, attending Polish Mass at St. Vincent's Church in Asheville and Polish events at the Asheville and Bankstown Polish Clubs. Anthony loved entertaining and often invited his Polish friends for lunch after church to his home or to the Asheville Polish Club to enjoy his favorite Polish delicacies. Anthony is best remembered as a very welcoming, warm, charming, friendly, and generous family man with a cheeky side who loved his laughter and enjoying good food in the company of loved ones. 
My grandmother Pelagia has remained a devoted wife, mother and grandmother over the course of her life, taking great pride in her home and family. Pelagia loved to cook and nothing would make Pelagia happier than sharing a meal with family and friends, enjoying each other's company. There would always be an overabundance of food at any family event as Polish tradition demands with second and third helpings the usual practice. Plagia always kept Polish cultural and religious traditions alive, such as the decoration and blessing of beautifully decorated Easter eggs every Easter and Christmas vigil with family and friends. It is this enjoyment of love of life and Polish culture and traditions that we carry on in our celebration of our cultural roots today. And I'm certain that the story of courage and love of my grandparents echoes the stories of so many others here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry after that speech. <laughs> and I think um, the younger generations could definitely learn a thing or two, put down the phone and get a pen pal. Um, well, our next guest and our final speaker today is Anya Yule, whose family is from South Sudan. Anya was born in a refugee camp in Kenya and is a former football player, PhD candidate, model and founder of a beauty pageant for women of colour. Anya is also the recently announced winner of the UNHCR 2023 Les Murray Award, recognising the talent, creativity and courage of refugees who are helping to make Australia more inclusive and diverse. Please bring, give a big warm welcome to Anya. You know, I was going to take my jacket off, but Cole has no barrier, so I'll keep it on. How's everyone this morning? Good, we're looking very bright. That's good to hear. Thank you for that wonderful announcement. Um, I don't know where to start. First, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, I feel honoured to be standing in front of you and to be sharing a little bit about myself and my background. When I was asked that I was going to give a quick five minute talk, I was wondering where am I going to start. I was asked to send a speech through, which I didn't. So let's hope that I do not bore you. <laughs> they didn't do a checkup background yet. Um, look, my journey, just like many of you here today, um, we've all been forced or we either made a decision to leave for a better future. I was forced to leave home at a younger age. My journey of migration or my journey as a refugee started with my family were forced out of Sudan due to war. Through that, I was then forced to be born in a refugee camp. And through that, I find myself in front of you today. To some people, you might think that the journey was quite bad. But to me, I saw it an opportunity for what I could become in the future. And my journey, spending that 10 years in a refugee camp, I saw it nothing but a preparation of what I could do to add a contribution into the society that I am today. I represent many young women of diverse background as I stand in front of you. My name, going up today just like you, is a representation of young women who are refugees, young women who are migrants, and young women who want to see themselves represented as just an Australian as they want to become. And so when I was asked again to come, and when I, when I was asked that my name was going to be engraved, I said, wow, what have I done? But then I thought about it, and I said, it's one of those situations where we have to reflect because the journey started with something small. It's been 20 years since I've been here. And when I reflect on what I have contributed to the Australian community, I think I can give myself a bit of a pat in the back. And I do know the communities that I represented today and the community that I have left behind in the refugee camp will be very proud of the contribution that I made into the Australian society. My work that I do now was a reflection of when I received my education in Australia, which opened my eye to the significant issues and the barriers that many communities face in Australia. 
And so when we talk about migration or when we talk about refugees and we talk about the contribution that they could add into the Australian society, we have to assess individual based on the resilience, based on the capability to integrate into a community. We have to assess on what resources and how do we support those communities to make better choice to be aided in their communities. I was lucky to be nurtured before I even moved to Australia. I was shown the way that we live in unbalanced society, that we live in a world where some have the opportunity to migrate, some have the opportunity to be given an opportunity to move to different countries. I was one of the luckiest refugees to come to Australia. Not by choice, but by opportunity that I was represented, I knew I had a foot in this country. And so I started when I moved to Australia by falling in love with sport, the true hard sport of Australian, cricket. <laughs> yeah? I started playing cricket when I came to Australia and I fell in love. But my awakening to become an advocate for those who don't see themselves represented is when I was told by my family that you cannot be a sport player because we do not see women on the national television. SBS, <laughs> you gotta broadcast the women football. And so I was disencouraged to play cricket. But it took me another two years to challenge my family and I say, no, I wanna play sport. And I find myself choosing soccer, football in the world eyes. And from there, I rise above. But what it did told me, it was there was a lack of gender equity when it come to sport participation. And I had to start it within my own community to talk about what equal representation mean for women. And that told me that we were not equal and that I had to reflect on my journey coming to Australia and what I wanted to do differently. And that's how I started to become an advocate for women in sport. So I started to be an advocate for refugee women to understand what is the playing field in Australia. And so my representation and the work that I do is because I have seen what I can contribute to other people how I can make sure that I create the path and enable every young woman or every person that look at me and say, I want to be like her one day. I have been nurtured, I've been protected, I've been given opportunity. And the one thing that I've always told myself is I can only go far if I take the opportunity. And I can only make a world a better place if I take the opportunity. And so I stand in front of you today knowing that what I have done has been because I've been given the opportunity to come to Australia by force, but at the same time, it given me so much and I know the future is still bright. And with everyone here today, I've heard before that you are the reason that we're all here. We have contributed and we are continuing to contribute to this society. What I do today and what you do today is going to have a significant impact for the next generation of migrants and refugees to come. My name today will speak more for those young women who will say that the sky is the limit and I'd like my name to be up there again next year. And so I'll walk away today with pride, making sure that I tell every young woman, every young person of a refugee and migrant background that their next day will come tomorrow. And so thank you for having me. I've been here over 30 years and still haven't quite worked out cricket, so well done. <laughs> um, we now have a performance by Stephen Murray and Stephen Malaki. They will be performing traditional Irish songs. Please make them feel welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we're going to be here for the next couple of minutes. Some, um, traditional jigs and reels um, from Ireland, so I uh, hope you really enjoy, so thank you again.
you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna sing um we're gonna sing a song from the very famous vocalist Luke Kelly. It's called the Night Visiting Song. So we're we're just gonna do this one together. Test. Luke Kelly song, the night visit song now. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go and uh, we're gonna do uh, an instrumental duet now. Stephen has the, the low whistle with him here, so a few reels.
you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you so much, folks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Stevens, Stephen Murray and Stephen Malarkey. I love an Irish accent as well. <laughs> Now, everyone, we trust you can take some time to enjoy your day here. For everyone that has stuck around for the performance, you might have, might have noticed some people slip into the sunshine there and have a look for their names on the wall. Please visit the museum while you're here today. We have lots to see, and the museum is open until 4 p.m., so please ask staff for details. Now that we've unveiled the new panels in front of me, please go and view your name. There is no rush. There is plenty of time, but it is delightful in the sunshine. It's quite cold in the shade. Um, 
there are a lot of people here today, so please be kind to each other as you look for your name. Please join me in thanking all our speakers and sharing their stories and our performers today. Thank you all again for attending to help celebrate the lives and contributions of those honoured on the monument today and helping us all create this wonderful occasion. Congratulations to you all. Have a great day. Happy Saturday, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.